What's up, Giants fans? Welcome to another episode of Giants Talk. I'm Cole Kuyper here with Giants insider Alex Pavlovich. Um, we almost did an emergency podcast based on the City Connect news or lack thereof. So we'll talk about that disaster because, as you can imagine, quite upset about it. Giants lose a series to the Nationals, probably more important than the Jersey fiasco, but we'll discuss that as well and what they can do to get back on track. Is there anything solvable here? Still early, don't worry too much. Before we get started, though, Giants Talk is presented by Mancini Sleep World. This Mancini Sleep World during our We'll Pay the Sales Tax event. Save big on premium mattresses plus free delivery. Hurry in now or visit us online at sleepworld.com. All right, Alex, let's talk City Connects. I gotta, I gotta ask, did you sense this was coming or something last episode? Because when you broach the idea of the City Connects not being here in time, it was just completely out of left field for me. I, it's happened to another team. I think it was the Cardinals this year. You put this into the world. I'm quite upset at you if, you, if you're <laughs> not understanding. I actually had no idea. I think you brought it up and I my first thought was like yeah of course they're not going to be ready like this is we've been dealing with fanatics it, it was the biggest story of the spring um there are continued issues I think it's died down a little bit but every once in a while like a guy's pants rip when he's sliding into the plate or yeah um I think it's now three or four teams that have not gotten their city connects and basically what happened is teams were told you can prioritize which ones you want at the start of the year. Everybody, of course, is going to choose home and road. Um, and then they're given these windows where you can pick a date for when you, you'll you get this extra jersey um, for the Giants. That's the City Connect. They have May 14th is their date when it'll arrive. Um, I would also add that they're not going to have the Gigantes jerseys this year because they're limited in how many jerseys they can have in general. So... <laughs> Uh, all sorts of issues here. I, I think the main thing that stood out to me was just fanatics being like, well, we got you your home and roads. Thank you. Thank you. Like, great work, ever. Great work oh. to the official outfitter of Major League Baseball to make sure that on opening day, every team had a jersey on. So congratulations on that. But uh, other than that, I mean, this has just been an ongoing disaster. Obviously, I was in the middle of part of it in March at some point or in February. <laughs> um and I think a lot of teams are dealing with this where it's just like, hey, we got you two jerseys. Now, if you want other ones, they did get the black ones. Uh, they wore those on Saturday. But okay. if you want other ones, like it's just going to take a while. I don't understand it. I, you know, that's a different world, really, I think, like to, the business side yes. of it. But it does seem like a company that has just kind of skimped on a lot of things and, and you know, uh, tens of billion dollar organization in major league baseball doesn't seem to care that like something embarrassing happens every single week with their official re retailer yeah they they sounds like they sourced out the jerseys this year to the lowest bidder and it's just been disaster after disaster you talked about players pants ripping as they slide into home plate you can see players balls and strikes through the pants on jerseys um jerseys not being ready i mean the the way the names look on the back has gotten complaints across the board from players current retired and fans and now the jerseys not being on here on time they're going to pat themselves on the back over having home and aways ready well yeah that's the bare minimum a vendor like this can do tuesday's game the giants had the bases loaded with no outs in the ninth inning, if they're wearing the city connects, they win that game. You know, it was about it's, this time of year obvious. ago. Yeah, it was about this time of year ago when Blake Sable hit a, a walk off home run off pretty good reliever in the city connects. I, I'll also add, I think they're not in the team store, is some is what I heard. Oh I don't know God. if this is true. You, you're the one who goes in there, you can check for yeah. it. But yeah, one thing about those jerseys, even though a lot of people dislike them and are on the other side of this from one Cole Kuiper. <laughs> they really sell well. So I, I think that, you know, I, if you had to ask me what would be the most popular jersey in the team store this year, I'd probably guess the City Connect Jung Hoo Lee. And I don't know that that's available yet. So somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I saw that on Twitter last night, which means it's true. But anyway, just, uh, you know, on we go. So uh, and let me take it out of its own way. Yeah, at, at least this isn't the Giants 
taking an L this time. This is someone else doing it, forcing yeah. it upon them because they've gotten a lot of unforced errors this offseason. This isn't one of them. This isn't on them. I mean, they're they have almost three times as many wins as losses in City Connect jerseys. They're 26 and 10. I've been tracking. I've been in, I was an early adopter to these um, and lost their first game where they didn't have them this year. So everyone mark May 19th on your calendar. That's going to be a big game. Giants Dodgers. Um, as if the Giants Dodgers series couldn't get more important is the return of the tangerine uniforms. May 14th. What did I say? August? May, you said May 19th. And okay. Mr. Tuesday night, you should know that May 19th is yes. Sunday. So May, May 14th. May 14th. Be there. May is like two years from now, Alex. I I haven't wrapped my head around it, it conceptually is. It yet. Is. Um, all right. Let's talk the Giants opening home stand. They took on the Padres and the Nats um, ended up as a four and two home stand. Let's talk takeaways because um, it's Agreed. interesting. Uh, yes, it's interesting how how different those two series looked. Yeah, I think you're hyped about these city connects, and you just can't. Yeah, my my brain's all fuzzy right now. Yeah, I, okay. I gotta go, like, uh, take have a beer and and calm down. Yeah, it's you say it's interesting how different they looked. I actually thought they looked somewhat similar in that. Really, if you kind of take away the ninth inning on Friday, and then you know they they piled it on on Wednesday. Basically, every run they scored on the homestand was because somebody else made a mistake. So <laughs> even like early in Wednesday's game, they all right caught a little bit of a break when the center fielder couldn't um, track it down. Tough play, but, uh, you know, the ball rolls into the dugout on Tuesday. That allows him to score a run. Hassan Kim did not have a great weekend. That helped him a little bit. So just a really rough time for the lineup, and I, I think that's – the first thing people probably think of when they think of this homestand is 2.8 runs per game, 225 team batting average, runners in scoring position under 200. Um, left 18 runners on base Monday and Tuesday night. You mentioned Jeez. earlier bases loaded and all like bases loaded for Conforto and Chapman, and you don't score. It's um, who you want up pretty much. Yeah. So it's, it's a rough time right now for the lineup. I, I think for me, I, I know everybody goes to, you know, you don't have to look very look very hard on social media to find Mike Yastrzemski takes. Um, yeah. But Jorge Soler is batting 209, Chapman's 184. Um, Jungkook Lee's hitting the ball hard. Chapman's hitting the ball hard too, but Lee hasn't fully, I don't think, gotten going yet. Like full homestand at Oracle Park and a lot of ground balls to the right side. Not We expected like triples alley, right? So yes, um, that to me is like kind of the biggest issue here. And I, I know people want to, Tyro Estrada is at 174. I, I know people always want to like point to the quick fixes and like, you know, Luciano for Ahmed, uh, Matos for Yastrzemski. I'm tired of Austin Slater. You see it every single day. This ultimately, as most seasons do, come down to your main guys. And, yeah, um, you know, that was part of the problem in Los Angeles is Logan Webb struggled and he put that on himself. Um, and he put his team in a hole that night. And I, I think he took accountability Conforto has taken accountability for some of the issues that they've had at times um but I, I would just I think there's a lot of talk about kind of depth pieces and like ultimately it's up to those guys Jorge Soler was a big free agent addition Matt Chapman was a big addition so um you know that's a big spot for Chapman on Tuesday night and, and that's kind of why the last week has gone the way it has because you know they haven't hit a home run they didn't hit a home run the whole homestand and some of these yeah. guys they brought in were supposed to be able to to uh, do damage even at Oracle. Yeah, no, that that's kind of the point of them being here. And it's it's very sad to see the frustration of Bob Melvin's face during these post-game interviews because you can tell he's kind of dragging about it. It's uh it's a lot. You know, this team, after so many seasons of uh players who I don't know, the, the way they fit together, maybe there weren't that high of expectations on paper, even if the fans wanted them to perform better than they did, even the 2021 team, like what they did there was not at all what was going on on paper. So to finally have a team that looks like it should be working. When you look at the names, you look at the rosters, you look at all the puzzle pieces fit together and have the outcomes we've been having the past homestand and beyond. It's extremely frustrating, both for the fans and gotta be for Bob Melvin. And I would imagine, I haven't talked to him in a few days, but I would imagine Farhan's like, what more do I have to do here? Oh, like, yeah. 
Harlan's Harlan still was, getting criticized when he put together the team he was asked to put together by everyone. I really don't think there was any way to like, you know, I, I don't think anybody felt bad about the offseason coming out. This isn't you and I just being optimistic. Like everybody was no. pretty excited about what they did. And so far, these guys have not done a whole lot. So if you want to pinpoint what's going on here, like that's what it is. It's it's a bunch of guys they brought in. Jordan Hicks has been outstanding, but yep. they basically changed the whole heart of their lineup. And so far, they haven't done a whole lot. So it, it's, yeah, you, you know, the one guy who has is Conforto who opted in. So it's um yeah it's gonna be up to those guys and i do think like you know there's been a lot of hard hit balls so i, I don't think they're too concerned but um that someone needs to put a ball in the gap next time the bases are loaded and, and they were better on wednesday about certain things um but it was mostly the guys at the bottom of the order on wednesday yeah, i well. saw i saw the stat that Jung Hu lee has like the most hard hit balls in the league behind shohei mm-hmm. and it that's crazy considering he he seems he's just hitting them two people instead of where they end up needing to go. Yeah, that one I don't view as positively. I think he's been fine, but he's just hitting them all to infielders. So yeah, it's not like he's hitting a bunch of balls that are getting caught by diving catches in the outfield. Like he's he's smoking balls right to the right side of the infield. <laughs> which is, you know, unless you're Billy Hamilton in his prime, like he's not going to work. So mm-hmm. um, that stat, I kind of was like, yeah, probably there's 21 of them, I think, for him. Probably like 17 of those were to the right side of the infield. Uh, but he's, I, I think he'll be fine. And I think for a guy who's, it's a really tough adjustment and he's mm-hmm. made it look like it's not that tough for him. So, um, looking for more production, but I, I, that's what Melvin said on Monday when I asked him about making some changes and, you know, he basically was like, these are my guys. I'm going to stick yeah. with them for a while. And you're just looking for more production. And that's what you go down the list. And it's like, yeah, you just need more from the main guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the one of the main guys that they're not getting what they need out of right now um, is Patrick Bailey. Uh, Patrick Bailey's hitting, but one of the big, he's hitting and he's framing, I guess. But one of the big things he got a reputation for last year was don't you dare run on Patrick Bailey. Yeah. And all of a sudden it seems like words out that go ahead and go for it. I think word is out to run on the giants. And well, it- yeah, fair. They haven't done a great job of holding runners. Um, they have not done a great job when they pick guys off of, you know, completing that play. Um, so that, that's been an issue for them a couple times where they've had seemingly had a guy kind of hung up and, and it didn't work out. So I, I don't know that it's all on Patrick at the same time. He hasn't thrown very well early on. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very small sample. I, I think the bigger surprise to me has been, he's just dropped some balls, just flat out dropped like, some pitches that ah. a couple of pass balls, but a couple other ones that just like hit his glove and just dropped right down. And and I asked Melvin about that and he was like, I think he's, he's, he's Max wants to chime in on, on Patrick Bailey. He said, I, I think he's going to do a little bit, a little bit too much. And uh, you know, he's probably the best framer in major league baseball. And at times is maybe trying to frame a little bit too much. Yeah. Okay. It kind of makes sense. Thinking about where his glove goes after the pitch rather than where it needs to go before the pitch. Um, coming out of this series i mean last episode you and i talked a lot about how these are the games the team needs to win it's easy to say this is a long season um, there's a, uh, 162 games they're gonna have to win 80 something to be in contention so we got a lot of games to play but these are also the games that we'll be regretting this in september when the numbers start ticking it's a lot closer than we'd like and winnable games were lost early so it's teams like the Nationals, the Giants have to be beating. But you and I talked about how we can't consider them automatic wins. Why do the Nationals play so well against the Giants? Are they just built for this, or is this a luck thing? They're so pesky and so annoying. And I say that in a good way. Like, they take the extra base every single time. They go first to third every single time. And the Giants are a horrible matchup. Or they're a horrible matchup for the Giants because the Giants do not have good outfield arms. I mean, Lee threw a guy out, but he does not have a good arm in center. Mm-hmm. Um, in general, it's not an outfield of strong arms. I don't think they get to the ball very quickly in general. Um, they also and, make the little mistakes you can't make. And yeah. a team like the Nationals, yeah. the team that capitalizes on that. And that's exactly what they did last year as well. And, and so I, I think it was funny to watch the way Wednesday played out because the Giants – 
did the complete opposite. They <laughs> stole bases. They took the extra base. Part of that was because they finally played Tyler Fitzgerald. Um, but other guys were doing it as well, and other guys were trying. And and it was almost like a, it was like, oh, that worked against us for two days, and it worked against mm-hmm. us last year. So let's try it ourselves. Like maybe manufacture some runs. Maybe try to take the extra base. Like the little hidden thing about most outfielders now is almost none of them have good arms anymore. So like the teams that do constantly run, Otani constantly tests people. He did it at, at Dodger Stadium when the Giants were there. I saw him do it again Wednesday morning, and it took a perfect throw from Carlos Correa to get him I by saw like that. an inch. Mm-hmm. So the Dodgers do it. Um, the Giants just don't do it, and they're not really built to – to do it. But I think that's what makes the Nationals such a tough matchup for them. And, you know, I'd like to see him just push the envelope a little bit more just because, you know, there's just not a lot of good, good outfield arms out there. And there's not a, you know, teams just screw up a lot. So yeah. I, I think they did that on Wednesday and I'd like to see him do it more. Uh, outfield arms, I agree. They should be running more. What about stealing bases? Stealing bases have not been happening. Um, it took, what, until Wednesday to get their first one? Yeah, it took until uh, the second inning of their 13th game. And then, and then they kind of piled them on a little bit, but it it's it seems like this is a team that needs to be taking advantage of that kind of thing, right? If the word's out to run on the Giants, maybe the Giants hit back a little? Well, it's funny because they you know they wanted to get more athletic, and they certainly got more athletic in the offseason. But I, I I don't think Lee is you know a burner. He's, he's above average speed, but mm-hmm. um, he doesn't fully look comfortable yet too. And, and certainly there's an adjustment for him trying to come over here and, and learn pitchers. And we saw that after his first hit. So yep, that's right. um, Chapman's pretty fast for a third baseman, but not going to steal a ton of bases. And then you have like Tyro and Austin Slater are the two semi-regulars who are probably your best bets to, to do that. And neither one of them has gotten on base basically. That's a great season. point. So, yeah. Um, it, it was basically up to Tyler Fitzgerald to get in there and make things happen. I'd like to see him play more. I mean, I all we hear from people is Matos, 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 Luciano, Luciano, Luciano. Mm-hmm. Nobody's banging the drum for Tyler Fitzgerald. And I, I think the fact that he had one start through 12 games and um, I think went like 10 days without an at-bat is not ideal. And I yeah. know Melvin wants to stick to his guys, but uh, Fitzgerald can move around. They can find a spot for him and and he has speed and he has the ability to to make some things happen as as he did on Wednesday. And I, I do think just going back to those other guys, like Nick Ahmed so far leads the majors and outs above average. They're not going to make a change there. And I always think it's funny when I see the tweets about Matos, because I always want to respond, like, can you go look up his AAA stats? Because as you and I are sitting here right now, he's hitting 222 in AAA. So that's that yeah. certainly would get higher in the major leagues, right, Alex? That's how it works. You know, I'm a big fan of his. I think he's going to be a good player. Um, I've said here I would be fine with them giving him a shot, but also like you can see why Melvin's like I'm going to stick it out a little bit with with Yaz and Slater and see what we have here before we make a move. But the one young guy they have who they can really mix in right now is Fitzgerald because he's on the roster and he's going to be on the roster. And yeah. it goes back to your original point of this team doesn't run at all. And that guy does. So we saw Wednesday how disrupted that can be. I'd, I'd like to see more of it. Yeah. All right. So this podcast's new agenda is get Tyler Fitzgerald playing more. I'm totally on board with that. Um, and if he's he's going to be our speedster, let's make it happen. Let's talk the ballpark. Um, did you get a chance to try the garlic fries? I have not yet. That's a once a year thing for me. Okay. It, really? Yeah. It's a it's a lot. Like, okay. Plus, like, I'm people, well, you know, you watch the post game scrums, like, I'm six inches from Logan Webb. I can't be like, you can't be bringing garlic into the scrum. In. Yeah, these are some that tight would get, scrums. Here's some space out. I mean, maybe it's exactly what you need. I'd like to do that with some people. So these are <laughs> um, some. Well, I did have them, um, and I'm going to give them a, a light thumbs down. I've, I've heard a lot of bad things about them. I think maybe this is just uh, we're in the era of complaining. Um, I don't think they were as bad as everyone's been saying. They certainly were not an improvement. Yeah, I'm I'm going to give them a couple home stands and let them find, you know, the error mark thing happened pretty late. Let yeah, them, that's true. Let them find their rhythm here. But we we have heard some complaints, and you and I said on the last episode, like, that's on our radar. We're, we're tracking this one just as we tracked mm-hmm. Chicken Fingers last year. We'll continue to track that as well. 
Um, so that's on the radar. I did have a really good pastrami sandwich. If you have. Oh, the, I'm all in on that. Yeah. This goes back to like when I was like the Gotham club nachos are great, but also you have to get into the Gotham club, like the field club, uh, which is down below there um, under the behind the plate, right behind the plate. It's much more accessible. And actually I saw someone on Twitter tweet that they got tickets like right behind the plate for like 20, 23 bucks. So hmm. I think field club's pretty accessible right now and um, good food down there and, and had a really good pastrami sandwich. So that's my recommendation through the first homestand. And then, you know, I think we are, we try to do the ballpark experience. Um, the Jung Hoo Lee chant, a plus like we it, need a good chant we need, a, we've needed one yeah it's a good chant i give the ballpark ops people credit for kind of spurring it on with uh some drums there i think they do ha sung kim and i know they do ha sung kim in san diego so this is stealing that a little bit but what you know you can't steal a chant so it's a yeah um that was good and then the downside was they played three night games and had absolutely zero moments where they could use their lights no home runs no walk-offs oh that was the worst part about tuesday night's game is like if chapman puts one in the gap there like the lights probably turn off and camilo yeah. was warming up in case they they uh tied it or took the lead and then they gave up another run um so we sat back down so i, I know they have big things planned for him so that's Pretty, I think they have to wait until like April 18th or 19th minimum to to try to use the new lights. I, I think there's probably some pretty disappointed people in the organization. Yeah, you know, we, we, we I feel like we foreshadowed accidentally a lot of things because we even made that joke too. What if they just never get a chance to use the fancy new lights? So yeah. a, another road trip to wait before we get those. I got a question for you about the ballpark experience. Are you a super anti the wave guy? Are you a I don't care about the wave guy? Or are you a they should be doing the wave at Oracle Park guy? I personally don't really care. Um, I think the whole point of all this is to have fun. So yeah. I I don't care about beach balls. I don't care about the wave. I don't care about lights. Um, and I by don't care, I mean, like, I think all those things are fine. Like, it's this is all supposed to be fun. And like Monday and Tuesday were college nights at the ballpark. Mm -hmm. Very rowdy. Um, I would say probably very drunk crowds, especially Monday night. Uh, I think it was San Francisco State that night. They certainly represented. Um, so, you know, they want to do the wave. Like, I don't care, especially when the team's losing. Like, people are trying to have some fun. They paid a lot of money to come to the game. So I personally don't care. I also know that it's one of those things where it's like you make so much fun of the Dodgers for doing it that then you just can't do it. Yeah. So I think that is, yeah. is that there is, it's basically universal across the fan base of making fun of the Dodgers for that, that when it starts at Oracle, it's like, well, there goes your footing. So I think that's why people get annoyed. I mean, I, I kind of feel the same way. Like I, I'm sure if you search old episodes of this podcast or search my social media, there's me bashing the wave. It's very performative. It's just like what's expected as a Giants fan. You have to be against the wave. Um, but it is funny to see how bent out of shape people online get about yeah. seeing the wave attempted, not even executed, but attempted. At oh, it, was, it went around the ballpark a couple times. And then uh, I love that. And then we threw a guy out at third and everybody found something else to cheer for. But yeah, it, it is hated. So I guess that's how you know a new crop of Giants fans are are coming to the ballpark, coming out to the yard. They don't know all the uh, the rules, the unspoken rules and regulations of Oracle Park. I do think we saw it last year quite a bit. Um, there's some really young crowds there now. And yeah. you and I know we have a lot of really young listeners, which is great. And um, I think those people say, you know what? I came out here on a Monday night and you're not going to tell me not to do the wave. So yeah. If Which I want always, to stand up in unison with my fellow fans. I will do it. And I have that right. If you paid like $17 for a beer and the Giants are 0 for 10 with runners in scoring position and someone gets mad at you because you decided to stand for half a second, like I, I'm on your side. Uh, you well, want. but yeah, this we has, had our first this wave. Has been my, yeah, my moment of sanity regarding the wave. I'm sure the next time we discuss it, I will be vehemently anti wave. Um, it's probably going to be next time they're at Dodger State. Probably. But yeah, you know me. I uh, hypocrisy is is something I'm totally, totally fine with. 
we talked a lot about the ballpark experience at this point, but one more thing, I'm just going to keep peppering you with, what do you think about, what do you think about, what do you think about, what do you think about the goofy inflatable Lucille? Oh, I'm in. Um, I, I think that's hilarious. I think it's funny. And I think, um, well, I guess I'll say he, cause I know who's in there. He uh, Is I, it the same guy? I believe I, I yeah. believe so. I don't know. I, I mean, have, I oh. assumed they did it. Because I, I know who's in Lucille, too. I yeah. assume they did it so he could, like, have a break or go, like, meet and greet in the luxury suites or do something away from the action. Here's what I'll, I have. I have a slight problem with it if it's not the same guy. Oh, it, interesting. It if this is, like, be, a scab situation. It would be one mascot, not two. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't. I don't want Lucille doing a meet and greet while someone's in a giant rubber <laughs> weightable on the field. Um, I thought it was funny. I tweeted out a video because whoever was in there got stuck for a second. I Did think they? you can move around in there so you can like jump on oh. your. Yeah. I, I saw that. You can tell when they do the handstand yeah. thing that they flipped yeah. upside down. That's pretty. Uh, I saw some people fawning over the impressive athleticism there. And I was like, I can't tell if you're doing a bit or if, uh, if you don't realize he's upside down. No, it's again, I go back to, this is all supposed to be fun. And you know, my, the biggest problem I think with the giants through 13 games is it has not been a lot of fun. And yeah. so, so if there's somebody who came to the park or somebody who was watching the game who got some entertainment out of the new Lucille jumping on his head, like great. Cause it's because it was not a very fun home stand other than that. And I got a pitch, a tweet to the inflatable Lucille. It made an inflatable crazy crap. I'm all for I'm all, for all these weird things. So. Yeah, if we're gonna get a second version of the mascot why not bring back an oldie but goodie that's what the seals is a is a reference to a throwback let's uh let's bring the crab back he can stand upside down on his head he can wiggle around and then the people who are anti the new inflatable mascot can even double down on yeah. their anti-ness and i've said the crab, times, right to be like, hated i loved what the marlins used to do with the statue and the nightclub and oh yeah I, I'm all for all that stuff. So bring on more weird stuff. All right. Let's get weird. At the very least, it will be fun. Um, let's also talk Giants Rays. Giants are not we're headed to Florida. They're not playing the Marlins. They're playing the Rays. Um, not the Marlins. Uh, but let's talk probable matchups and anything else you need to know about that series. But first, Giants Talk is presented by Toyota. Take the Giants on the go this season and stream the games on the NBC Sports app. Brought to you by Toyota. All right, we have a very exciting list of names from, from my research, Alex. On the race side, it's TBD, TBD, and TBD. Is that what you have? You know, ordinarily I would um I would try to correct you, but I you never the rays are like the king of like you legit never. I mean, they started the opener thing. So yeah, I have no idea. I'm sure we'll see Zach Littell at some point. Um mm -hmm. you know, there's Zach Eflin's there. There's, I think Brian Pepio is getting one of those games. I've always thought he was pretty good. Um, but you, you just have no idea who you're going to see when you go down there. We do know who we're going to see on the Giants side. Right now it's Keaton Wynn, Logan Webb, and Blake Snell. Interestingly enough, for those group of three, actually when you include the TBDs as well, zero wins to their name so far this year. So we've got three guys hunting for their first win of the 2024 season. Yeah, kind of big weekend for all of them i think you know keaton took a really rough box score on saturday i think he's hit yeah. pretty well probably eager to to stop saying like i thought i pitched well he's probably eager to actually get a win one of these times <laughs> um you know logan still hasn't clicked in so mm -hmm. and then blake snell that team drafted him in 2011 yeah. he won a cy young there he went to the world series there so uh it's a big deal for him and certainly First start did not go quite. I guess we kind of glossed over that during all this, but his first start. Yeah, we kind of did. Did you not want to talk go, Blake Snell for right. a quick second. I I don't know that we were ever going to learn anything from it, other than like if he was throwing ninety three and he wasn't, he yeah. was throwing ninety seven. So the stuff was good. Um, I think he was. He said this after the game. He was. He called it nitpicking. I mean, I, I think for a not very good lineup, he probably was. Yeah, nitpicking too much, and and they made mm -hmm. him. And, um, I just think he was rusty, and for me, like it's, you know, again, I, I've said this a couple times on this podcast here and other places. Like the closest he got to having a spring training, 
appearance or facing big leaguers was facing Slater Fitzgerald and Yaz at Dodger Stadium in front of like 40 people. So <laughs> then you go to it. Yeah. See how the adrenaline is a little different in those two situations. Yeah. You go to Monday night and um, not what he wanted the first time out, not what the Giants wanted, but the stuff was good. And the fastball especially had a lot of life. So I don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, they put up multiple runs. What was it? I think they got him in the second inning. Um, so super early. It's, it's not something I'm too worried about too. It is just disappointing. And I guess, you know, this is just me being cranky about the whole situation, but it would have been really great. Like he had been training, handling himself enough that if he signed late, he could be ready to go at the start of the year. And it just did not seem like he was ready to go on Monday, still working out his, his big league routine. And I hope he's ready to go in his next appearance. I just don't think there's a, an answer for that other than yeah signing earlier. So yeah. Um, another guy worth mentioning is old friend of the Giants, Zach Littell, who uh, who ended his, his Giants tenure on very interesting terms. Um, but at least Dave Kapler is no longer here to have that awkward com- uh, com- confrontation with him. Uh, Liz- Littell has started three games down there. He's got a nice little one one seven ERA, and he does have a win to his name, unlike the three pitchers the Giants are putting forward. So, uh, if there is any, I doubt it, but if there are any Latell heads who listen to this podcast, here's your guy. We get a little reunion. I don't know if we ever got to, uh, you know, people find pretty fringe players sometimes to become huge fans of. And we see about social media and like, this is my guy. Don't know if there were any Latell heads, but uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like enough people disliked Gabe that that confrontation might have been enough to uh to sell a jersey or two possibly that was that was a funny one i still enjoy the giants claiming that he got sent back to triple a for other reasons completely unreleated that that was the end of his uh big league tenure with the giants. but you know what yeah. he's made a nice career out of it there in tampa bay and he's turned yeah. into a starter and it's like as we watch jordan hicks do this and you know mm-hmm. maybe a cy young candidate if he can keep this going like it's interesting to see some of these guys who just went yeah i can start and teams went yeah. i think you can start and all of a sudden you just you throw them out there we saw him last year and and it's like wait zach Patel's throwing five innings now oh yeah sure and i, I think you go to this year it's like zach Patel's actually been pretty good so it's- it really makes you wonder if this was a change these guys made or if they were being misused all along because i kind of look at the jordan hicks thing as he's been used incorrectly his whole career who knew this was in there? The Hicks one is going to be. I'm curious what the reaction will be if if he's still in the rotation and pitching well. And I I don't I mean in the rotation just in that you know you also hope a guy stays healthy and uh, yeah can handle this kind of workload when they go to St. Louis um, in June because I've seen already some stuff on social media from Cardinals fans, a very reasonable bunch, who are like, what did we do with this guy? Like. Yeah, this was here the whole time and we we never did this. So they tried it. But I, I think, you know, he's even said they didn't really give him a, a fair shot when they let him start games. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes it's just like, hey, this guy's one of your most talented people. And, and the Hicks thing, I, I just think it's fascinating because he just has Mike Kruko said this on the broadcast a couple of times, just had the has the ability to pitch. Like, it's not like he's out there just throwing 98 for six innings. He's mixing speeds. He's getting double plays when he has to. Um, his hardest pitch on Wednesday, he threw behind the guy's head, which was probably not on purpose. But like, that's what happens when he tries to dive it up to 99. Now he's like, you know what? I'll be at 96. I'll be fine. Um, I, I think what he's doing is really interesting, and and uh, yeah, I I think it'll probably lead to to more teams going like, maybe maybe this is worth it because if you hit yeah. on it with like a Gosman or a Hicks so far, even Latell to an extent, like you really strike gold. Totally, totally. And we look at how hard it is to piece together those arms you need to fill out the rotation. And it's, it's going to be one of the answers teams look for, you know, in the future. But that's all we got for Giants to talk today. Thanks for tuning in. Giants are heading to Florida for Tampa and then the Miami Marlins. Um, and we'll be back with more coverage on Monday and more episodes throughout the entire year. Thanks for listening.